Okay, so let's jump right back in. We just finished talking about um, this flight envelope. And this flight envelope tells me, you know, for a uh, uh, kind of a range of altitudes and speeds that I can fly in safely. Okay, and this assumes that I'm flying uh, this kind of steady level flight condition. So that's another uh, metric I'm gonna need to consider. And this is what's captured in what's called the load factors. We've talked about this a little bit before. Um, so remember that load factor, we use, let's use the symbol N, it's just a ratio of lift to weight. So if I'm in steady level flight, it's one, but my aircraft needs to maneuver. So we're often gonna have load factors that are not equal to one, right? Because of course I need to climb, I need to turn. As we turn, right, we need to increase our, late, our lift to be larger than our weight in order to maintain a vertical balance. So there's gonna be some component lift going into the turn. Um, and there's also gonna be gusts, right? So wind is gonna come along. Um, even if I'm flying steady, I get this gust, that's gonna increase my load. So if I've designed my airplane only to look at a steady level flight condition, I'm gonna be in trouble because uh, I need to consider what, what, how many, uh, well, let me say it this way, remember that we express N in terms of what, what's called Gs. So when N equals one, we say that's a one G case. Uh, and so the question is how, I, I need to pull more Gs and maybe even negative Gs, right? How many times when I need to ascend um, so that my lift is gonna drop below. Uh, and, and so in all these cases, I need to understand the flight envelope in terms of the Gs that I'm gonna pull in my airplane, okay? Um, before we jump into a diagram that's going to look at that, uh, there's one other sort of preliminary we discuss what's called the dive speed. And this comes from the FARs, the Federal Aviation Regulations, the FARs. Um, if I have, let's say, BC, which is my cruise speed, that's something where I'm going to normally fly at, we're going to have a higher speed, which is called the dive speed. And the regulations say that at worst, worst case, meaning you don't want to do any testing or analysis, then we're just going to say that the dive speed is 25% higher than the cruise speed, okay? So if you do nothing else, then you have to design your airplane so it can fly at least up to that point, right, to that dive speed. However, there's, uh, the FARs also say that you can uh, figure out what the speed is going to be. You do a dive, and you just, you know, I'll just say it's a dive at 7.5 degrees, Low flight path for 20 seconds and then you pull up at one and a half G's. And then through the whole process, you figure out what your maximum speed would be. And, you know, it turns out, well, of course, that's going to differ for most airplanes, but most of the time it's going to be a bit less, right? Let's say something like 15% larger. Again, it's a little bit aircraft dependent. So if you don't have the capability or don't want to do those tests, then you have to at least, you have to design for this. But if you can demonstrate that you're never going to get to those kind of high speeds, that even with a this long dive and a pull up, you only get to uh, the smaller number, then you don't have to design all the way up to this higher number. Okay, so uh, one last preliminary um, is a safety factor. Actually, I'm going to save that for later. We should have, yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. So this is what's called a VN diagram. N is the load factor that we've talked about. V is a speed, and this time we're going to look at it in terms of equivalent airspeed. Um, remember, this is the one that's our dynamic pressure. It's going to be more useful in this case because uh, the last, the last uh, diagram, notice how we had altitude as one of the things. And, that's, and, and so we wanted to see how things change with altitude. Here, if we did true airspeed, it would not be as useful. Um, so think about that for a second. Why would true airspeed not be as useful in this plot as compared to equivalent airspeed? The reason for that is that, remember what equivalent airspeed is, it's a constant, right, for a given, for our structure. Uh, it doesn't change, or I guess I should say it's a constant. Uh, it doesn't change with altitude. It just is based on that reference of sea level. Um, so in other words, if I use true airspeed here, I would have to create a separate diagram for every possible altitude, or really every density, if you will. Um, in the last plot, we wanted to see that variation with altitude. Altitude was on the axis, so it made sense, sense to use true airspeed. It helps us to kind of understand what's happening. Here, because altitude is not part of this plot, uh, it's better to use equivalent airspeed, because again, otherwise we have to create a separate diagram for every altitude, whereas in this case, we can just make one plot that works for any altitude. And that's really the usefulness here of this equivalent airspeed. 
Okay, so um, this one may be a little bit less intuitive at first, um, and a lot of it is really governed by the regulations. So it's kind of a bit rule driven, uh, but we will talk about some of these. So first of all, there's gonna be a cap. Okay, I'm just gonna draw a straight line here. This is gonna be uh, the maximum load factor that you need to design to. And there's a formula uh, given by the regulations. Uh, it's gonna look like this if the weight is in pounds. Um, okay, so put in weight in pounds and you can get a formula, except for it's also gotta be at least 2.5 and you don't need to exceed 3.8. So for a transport aircraft, transport aircraft have huge weights. Um, and so this number generally falls below 2.5. And so you have to use this boundary. You can't go below this one. So this often is 2.5 for large airplanes. Whereas for a very small plane, um, this number may be small enough that you're greater than 3.8. And so you'd have to use 3.8, right? You can't, you don't, you don't need to design or anything larger than that. Okay, and so that would be, let's say this was um, 2.5, let's say this would be a large transport aircraft, right? So that would be my upper limit. Um, this dive speed corresponds to the right side limit, right, that we don't need to go to any speed bigger than that. And that was again, either specified by the regulations or we did an actual dive for pull up and showed that it would, uh, that was the fastest speed we could ever get to. Okay, so that's kind of a box. On the bottom side, there's no formula, it's just minus one. We don't need to do uh, anything, design or do anything more than a, a negative one G. And then the other sort of thing here is that um, we don't need to have as much uh, uh, of a flight envelope at these negative Gs, it's not a normal flight condition. So we actually cut this off between where this intersects at negative one at BC and this point right here at uh, zero Gs at BD. So that's another. So these lines are all just kind of defined by the regulation. The only other part that, uh, you know, has a, so, so these have some, you know, some reasons based on empirical data and such, uh, we won't get into, but there's one physical reason, reason, again, for limits on this side. What happens is I get to small speeds. Um, so this is gonna be stalled, but it's slightly different than what we talked about because this is not a 1G stall necessarily. Uh, just gonna, so let's, let's write that down. Let's write down the, the stall equation again. But first think about it in terms of our load factor. Remember what N is. N is L over W. So um, the maximum I can get to that's related to stall is gonna be CL max times one half rho P squared times my reference area, right? I'm just using that formula. Um, divided by the weight. And in this formula, right, because I don't, I'm not doing true airspeed, which this is in terms of, I'm going to do it in terms of equivalent airspeed. So I'm going to swap, whoops, to erase that. I'm going to swap out my dynamic pressure for the equivalent dynamic pressure. So rho at sea level, and then equivalent airspeed squared. Okay, so rho at sea level is a constant, weight's a constant, this is a constant, uh, CL max, uh, it's constant, but you can see that for different um, ends, right? I'm going to get a different, uh, or I'm going to get a different end for different equivalent airspeeds here. So, in other words, this curve is going to look kind of quadratic. If this is, you can see this is an equation of a of a parabola. This was a y equals some constant times x squared. It's going to look something like this. Okay. So we've been looking normally at this case where n is one, where the lift is equal to the weight, then we figure out our one g stall speed. But if I'm pulling, say, more g's, I'm pulling two g's, my stall speed is actually reduced, right? Because at two g's, this here is a two. Even though my seal max may be high, I can't go to high, as high of a speed before I uh, exceed, um, uh, before I exceed, you know, the limits of my my airplane for stalling, whereas at a lower G, right, I can actually get to a lower speed. Uh, the exact same thing is gonna occur on the negative side. In fact, for an airplane, CL max on the positive angle of attack versus neg negative angles of attack are usually different, but if not specified, you can just assume that they're the same, um, just an approximation, but it's gonna look very similar. Okay, so again, my envelope is gonna be the interior of all these lines. And that's going to be my safe region to fly in. Okay, 
So depending on the speed, I need to design my airplane. Uh, this is really more for design. The last one you can maybe think of more for operation. It's like, where can I fly? And depending on my speed, what or at my altitude, what speeds can I go to? Uh, kind of like a speed limit, a min and a max speed limit. Here, this is more for the structural designer. Say, these are the points that I need to design my airplane structurally to be safe in everywhere here. And generally, that means these sort of corners are going to be my most important point. Because if I can fly here, of course, I can fly here at a lower speed and a lower load factor. So I need to design for these corners. Um, yeah, and so both of these curves are a little bit more complex. The ones we talked about last time, you know, there's actually a little bit more to it. We ought, for in practice, because we'll look at things like flaps and slats, it'll modify seal max. Um, you may, we may sometimes put multiple knees in the curve, and here, uh, like I said, we may think about both seal max being different in the positive and negative, and we have to also think about GUS, which is kind of a separate procedure, but we won't go into that. This is kind of the basics here. Uh, again, this may be a little less natural first, but uh, so give it some thought, try to, to digest this. Again, the main takeaways here are that there's a speed that we need to design our plane, this is as fast as we can go. We need to design our plane that it's safe at those speeds. We need to make sure we can carry these large load factors. Um, you know, for a fighter, of course, it's gonna be much bigger. You know, maybe we need to go up to eight or whatever, right? These will be large load factors. Um, and on the negative end, we can go to a minus one G, which means that we're actually accelerating downward uh, at, um, with a force that's equal to our weight downward, so we're actually lifting downward with force equal to the weight. Um, and then of course with stall, right? We need to make sure that we can fly safely at this high load factor, still at our stall speed at the low speed and at the high speed range, similarly at negative load factors, both at low speeds and high speeds. Okay, um, there's also a safety factor that's applied. We're gonna look, look at this video in class, but if you're not there, this is a, Kind of a fun video to watch just to see how much a wing bends. The main takeaway is, of course, simple here, but it's just more for interest here, yeah. um, just to see how far wings do deflect in these tests. But the, the takeaway from it is just to emphasize the safety factor of 1.5. So you have to design your airplane in these limits, but then you also have to make sure that even up to this limit, it can take an additional safety factor of 1.5 beyond that uh, for the ultimate load case. Um, and that's a critical test. So you can see that in this diagram here, right? So this is kind of the VN diagram we've been talking about, but it needs to be able to design to uh, still be able to fly or to not break at these, uh, at a 1.5 safety factor, that's that point case. That doesn't mean you won't have damage, right? So this is kind of, uh, even though wings made are more composite, this doesn't quite apply, but for aluminum, say, this is often a similar ratio of the difference between the yield stress and the ultimate stress. It does mean the wing cannot break, right? You need to make sure it's still flyable, but you could still have internal damage because you see the yield point, right? So in these cases, you know, you need to do some repairs, but it would still be safe to fly. Um, and here's the difference between VC, VD, right? So this is just a, a diagram. Um, this is discussed more in the text. I'm not gonna get into it, but just again, highlight this idea that uh, these corners are generally, these are the things that we really need to design for. Um, this is my high speed, and this is gonna correspond to my low angle attack. At positive lift, this is gonna be the high angle attack. Um, low speed, right, for positive uh, angles of attack, and similarly on the negative angles of attack. And if you're interested in the text, there's some diagrams of kind of what those loads look like, because these are gonna put different parts of the beam and the airflow or the wing in compression and tension. So you can look at that in a bit more detail if you're interested. All right, so uh, that's it for this diagram. So again, uh, we've looked at two diagrams. The first was kind of looking at our operation. What are the speeds and altitudes that I could fly at? And that one makes sense to look at in terms of true airspeed because we want to see how things vary with altitude. Our second diagram was more for the structural design, thinking about um, what are the limits I need to design my airplane in? So this is a useful diagram if you're doing that. Uh, the structural analysis that you would first create this diagram and then figure out you know the load factors that you need to test at either an analysis or a physical test uh, say you're doing an optimization to put those load factors in run the stress analysis at all those different corners and make sure that uh, you know the aircraft is in safe operation for you know all the bending 
torsional shear loads that the airplane is going to be under and, and make sure there's no, no structural failures. Okay, so this wraps up our, our brief discussion on structures. We'll see you next time.